Hey everybody, welcome to another Author Show Board Game Review. This week we've been looking at Warhammer Quest Silver Tower. In this specific video I'm going to show you how to play the game. Now if you just want to check out a quick overview to get a rough idea of what Warhammer Quest Silver Tower is, check out my quick overview video. If you want to see some sample gameplay, check out that video. Or if you just want to bypass all that, see my opinion of the game, go ahead and bypass all those videos and check out my full review of the game. In this video my hope is to sit down and teach you how to play the game. But there's going to be one little caveat with this. See, Warhammer Quest Silver Tower is a very thematic game. And while it's not the thematic level of time stories, where I actually did a completely made-up scenario just to try to teach you how to play the game, where I did a whole bunch of, well, some pretty lousy printer voodoo judo, but whatever. The point is, is that there is some stuff in this game that's supposed to be experienced, almost like a story-driven game. So there are going to be some things I'm going to have to gloss over in this tutorial by simply saying, read the rule book. And I hate doing that because that's kind of defeats the purpose of these tutorial videos, but if I don't do that, you're going to have a whole bunch of surprises ruined. So I would do that as minimally as possible, but just understand it's just something I cannot avoid doing unless I want to write up a complete fake scenario. I did that for Hammer Hall. I did that for Time Stories. I just didn't want to do that for this video series because it's a lot of work. Anyways, before we go any further, there's one other point I want to mention on this. There is an FAQ available for the game. It's currently up to seven pages. Don't be scared by that fact. A lot of it is just a lot of clarification to prevent people from rules lowering some of the abilities and some of the things inside the game. Now, anybody who's played a Games Workshop game in the past or anybody who's been with the company for 30 years, like some people have, myself as a good example, can pretty much understand the verbiage that Games Workshop uses when they teach their games and they have the rule books. So a lot of this errata is a lot of a no kidding type of stuff. But if you ever have people who like a rules lawyer, who like to take the rules not as they're intended, but try to abuse the spirit and the rules as they're written, this FAQ may help you quite a bit. But there are two things that are definite changes in the rules that you will have to download this FAQ for. And they are actually part of the errata. And the errata actually only takes up pretty much one page, just so you know the difference there. The important thing to understand is what they've done is they've changed how the respite works. Now this is something I'm kind of waffling back and forth on. I actually kind of like the old respite rules and as I'm teaching this video, I'm going to show you how to use both versions of the rules and let you decide which version you like. I can see the advantages to each one based on the player count and based on the fact that players are playing through the entire scenario or just how they're playing the game. So I can see the advantages and the disadvantages to both the respite systems. So I'll teach you how to do both of them and I'll tell you which one's which. I'm going to teach you the rulebook version first and then I'm going to teach you the errata version which I think is the version that most people are using. But like I said, I can still see a good reason to use the original rules as they're written. So that's just my opinion. Also, one other very important thing, the very first scenario in the game. Again, this game does have a little bit of randomness. And in the very first scenario, you're going to be shuffling up these cars to dictate how the dungeon is going to be laid out as you're exploring the dungeon. Now, anytime you know that we have any bit of randomness, whether it's rolling the dice or shuffling cards, there's a chance that the card that shouldn't appear just might appear. So what they've gone done, I'm sorry, I've gone done, that's not very good English there. What they have done is they've clarified a more efficient way to organize the adventure deck for the very first adventure to ensure the final scenario where the final encounter comes up does not appear too soon, bringing the adventure to too early of a crashing close, which is going to allow you to miss out on some of the fun and some of the other things that can happen. So those are very two important things that are involved in the errata. I do want to specify that you make sure you check those out. Other than that, that's all you're going to really need from that errata. You can pretty much throw that back in the box and not worry about it. And then I'm going to give you one little tip that I personally like that I have done just to make the game flow much more efficiently. What I've done is I've personally photocopied the back of the adventure book. I've also photocopied the back of the rule book. And the reason why I've done that is because these books will be accessed quite a bit. And I actually like having the backs of these books handy for everybody to have so you don't have to be having flipping through the books back and forth because there are going to be times where you're going to need the book open and have the back of the book available to you at the same time. And the reason why that will happen is because the main rule book for the game all the way in the back, again this is one of those things I'm going to gloss over because I don't want to ruin a lot of the fun, but in the back of the book it has the AI and the statistics for all the bad guys. I'll explain the statistics, I'm not going to explain the AI because I want that to be part of the surprise of the game. but You'll notice that's also on the same part of the book that has the fact that shows a section on how the destiny dice can go awry. Also has a turn overview, which we're going to be able to look at all the time as you're learning how to play the game. So you don't want to be looking at the AI for the monsters at the same time you're remembering trying to how to play the game. 
So that's why I photocopied that back section of the rule book. And then I also photocopied the back section of the rule book that has all the encounters that you're gonna roll on for the random encounter table. Because that's on the back of the book that has a section on how all the random encounters and the storyline is gonna progress. And these encounters are gonna come up quite a bit, probably once, twice, maybe even three times per adventure based on how these destiny dice rolled out and also based on which adventure you're playing on. Some of these adventures are actually gonna rely on this book quite a bit and you're gonna be opening this book many, many times throughout one single adventure. And again, for ease and convenience, I made a photocopy of the back side of the book. Again, it's a convenience thing. It's something I suggest you do. But let's go ahead and bypass all that and teach you how to play Warhammer Quest Silver Tower. Like any good dungeon crawler, this game is made up of the heroes that make up the party which are experiencing this adventure. Now, at the start of every single game, you need to figure out how many heroes you're going to play the game through with. Now, again, this game plays from one to four players, but you need up to four heroes. Now, you can play with less heroes or up to that maximum. It's up to you. And the challenge and the difficulties of the game are going to vary based on however many heroes you use and just what heroes you happen to be using. Some of these heroes can actually go through these adventures all by themselves and have a pretty good chance of getting through the adventure. Some of these heroes, I probably wouldn't recommend going this alone, but they could probably go through with a partner or something along those lines. And some of these heroes are just very good at certain circumstances. Some heroes have some very good abilities that can strike everything in the room but do very little damage, which means they're great versus swarm-style enemies where you get attacked by a lot of enemies but they do not do a lot of damage, so they may be able to go through a lot of the rooms, but when they reach the final boss, or heaven forbid, they run into that little Skaven death dealer, they will get torn up very, very quickly. So again, that's part of the randomness, and it's something you need to decide, but this is just a short, well, not really short, but this is really a long-winded way of saying, pick your heroes based on what kind of experience you want to go. Just understand that the more balanced your party is, the better chances the law of averages is going to work in your favor, but you know, it's dice, it's cards, you may get screwed over anyways. It's just how things may work out. Now every single one of our heroes is going to get a hero card and every one of our heroes has a whole bunch of statistics and different abilities. And I'll just explain how every one of these heroes will work really, really quickly. Every one of our heroes is going to have a move statistic and that's how many spaces they can move on the board every time they spend an action die. And I'll backtrack on the action dice in just a moment here. Every player has an agility statistic and you, generally agility is going to be used to try to break away from an enemy if you happen to be standing adjacent to any enemies. And to simply do that, you're going to roll an action die. You need to roll that number or higher to do a successful breakaway. So, for example, the Mistweaver needs to roll a 3 or higher on a 6-sided die. The Excelsior War Priest needs to roll a 4 or higher to break away. And this stubby-legged little dwarf who cannot break away very well, but that's okay with him because he likes to mix things up anyway, needs to roll a 6 or higher on a 6-sided die. Well, you really can't go higher, but that's just the kind of syntax that Games Workshop likes to use for their game. So you understand it's that number or higher that you need to roll to make a successful attempt on any dice roll. Next thing you're going to notice is every one of our heroes has exactly four slots, one for a die per slot. Now, as our heroes take wounds, they're going to lose access to these locations. So whether they take a stun token, which is this symbol, which looks like this little crazy little line swirling around, or the back side of it, which happens to be a single skull, which happens to be a wound. If players start taking wounds, they're going to be able to roll less dice for their action. You can basically roll as many dice at your start of your turn based on however many openings you happen to have on your character sheet here. That doesn't mean that when you take the fourth wound that you're pretty much out of luck, though, because as long as you don't take that fifth wound, you're actually not knocked out of the game. And again, this game does not have player elimination, so you won't be knocked out permanently until you take that fifth wound you're just going to be knocked out until there's a respite. And I'll explain how all that works in just a little bit here. But you're going to get as many dice to roll for your action based on however many open slots you happen to have. If all four of your slots are filled with these little skull symbols, you cannot roll any action dice at the start of your turn. The only thing you can use is destiny dice. Luckily, destiny dice and player abilities such as Excelsior War Priest can heal you and remove these wounds. But just understand the start of your turn, you only get to roll as many action dice as you have open slots. So if you've taken one wound, you can roll three action dice. If you've taken three wounds, at the start of your turn, you're simply going to roll one action dice only. And I'll explain how all these action dice work as I explain the player turns. It's just very important to understand. You only get as many action dice as you have open slots in your character sheet. Now you'll see that all of our heroes so far in the base game only have four hit points or four action dice slots. So that's all you have available to you. And you're also going to notice that all of our heroes have a certain amount of special abilities and actions they can take on the turn. Every single one of these actions is going to have a number in parentheses that shows you the value of the die you must discard to perform that action. 
So for example, for the Miss Weaver to perform the elven blade ability, you need to have a die that has a one or higher facing on it and discard that die to use that ability. So that basically means that any die you roll, no matter what, you're basically going to be able to perform that ability, even with these four dice right here. So I've added a two, a five, and let's turn that to a three, and we'll turn this one finally to a six. So we see that we can discard this two, this three, this five, or the six to, six to perform this first ability, because to perform that ability, all we need to do is discard a die that has a one or higher on it. Whereas opposed to the illusionary assault, we'll see that we need to discard a die that has a three or higher to perform that ability. So that means this die right here cannot be used to perform that illusionary assault, but these other three dice can be, and simply you discard that die and perform that ability. And then finally we'll see the bedazzle takes a die that has a six or higher to perform that ability. That means none of these three dice can be used to perform that ability, only this die can do it right here. We'll simply discard that die and use that ability. And you notice that all of our heroes have the same basic type of thing going on for all their heroes. Most of our heroes have an ability that only takes a die of a one or higher, and a lot of them have special abilities that do more damage or extra special thing that'll take maybe a four, a five, or even a six to perform that ability that's pretty standard for all of our heroes. Now next to every single one of these abilities is going to tell you which kind of die is required to perform that ability. Then it's going to tell you what kind of range that ability has. Now a combat ability means you attack any mob that is adjacent to you. A missile ability means you can attack any mob that is in your line of sight, or I should say adversary, so I'll use the correct term here. A missile attack allows you to attack any adversary that happens to be in your line of sight. And I'll explain line of sight in just a little bit. But just understand that you cannot use a missile attack at all if there's an adversary next to you. So if there's an adversary next to you, even though you may have a die available to perform that missile attack, you cannot perform that missile attack until you have no adversaries next to you. When you have adversaries next to you, the only thing available to you is a combat ability or an area ability. If there's no adversaries next to you, you have missile abilities or area abilities that you can use. And then finally, you have the area abilities, which are going to affect every single adversary that happens to be on the same tile as you. And I'll show you exactly how that works as I get further into the tutorial. Just understand that combat is adjacent, missile is anything in line of sight, as long as there's no adversaries next to you. And finally, area affects everything that's on the current tile as your hero. You're going to see that there's a to hit number, and you're going to have to roll that number or higher on the die you discard to use that ability. So for example, if I want to use the Elven Blade, I need to discard a die that has a 1 or higher, and then I'm going to roll that die again, and then I need to roll this number or higher to make a successful hit. In this case, that 3 will be a miss. If I had happened to roll a 4, it would have been a hit, and I will do that many points of damage. So I'll do 1 point of damage with this Elven Blade. If I use the Illusionary Assault, I'm going to do a D3 of damage, and D3 is pretty simple. A 1 or 2 is a 1, 3 or 4 is a 2. 5 or a 6 is a 3, you're simply going to roll that and take that effect. So that would have been 1 point of damage with that Illusionary Assault. That would be 3 points of damage with the Illusionary Assault. And then finally, you're going to see some abilities will actually do status effects. For example, this one does a stun. Additionally, all of our heroes are going to have special abilities listed on them, and they're going to work just like our weapon actions. You'll simply need to discard a die with that value or higher, and you'll be able to perform that action. Additionally, do note that all of our heroes have two traits listed on them, and the traits will be very important. Sometimes traits will be referenced as you're doing dungeons. And I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but the very first dungeon does require one hero to have a specific trait. It won't shut you down if you don't have that specific trait, but you will definitely have extra advantages if one of your heroes has that trait. And then finally, you're going to see that all our heroes have an additional way to earn renown. Now, the very basic way in this game that you earn renown, which is a fancy way to say experience points, is you're going to get one point of renown or experience for every single enemy adversary that you happen to slay. If you perform whatever action gives you renown also, you can also earn additional renown by doing your special, whatever renown, special ability that you happen to have. For example, the priest gets renown if he happens to heal. The knight quester gets renown if he happens to defend very well. They're very thematic and they happen to fit with every single one of the characters. Additionally, players are going to be able to earn additional skills as they level up and gain experience. And some of these skills will reference certain kind of traits for every single hero. If your hero happens to have that trait, they're going to be able to use a more powerful version of that skill. If they don't have that trait, they cannot use a more powerful version of that skill, but they can still use the lesser version of that skill. Now, one important thing to understand is that you're going to be able to keep some skills at the end of every single adventure based on however many of these amulet pieces you've managed to track down and obtain for your party, but you can't keep all the skills. You only get to keep a certain amount of them. Also, you cannot trade skills with other players. So if it happens to be that the war priest happens to get this skill that requires arcane, 
and our Miss Weaver happens to get a trait skill that requires a holy power, it may be very unfortunate for them and they may want to figure out a way to get some extra skills so at the end of the venture, if they can't keep these, they can actually discard these skills they can't use as well, get them back in the skill pool so maybe possibly later on throughout the adventures, the hero who can use that skill can actually manage to draw it. Now all of our heroes have one more statistic I haven't mentioned yet and that's going to be the save statistic and this is going to be used to allow them to avoid taking wounds. Now bad guys do not have a save statistic, they have a vigor, which is a fancy way to say hit points, but all of our heroes have a save statistic. And basically what is going to happen is every time an enemy hits you, you're going to get to make a save to see if you can dodge that attack. Now it's not for every point of damage that enemy may do because you have some enemies that may hit you once and do four points of damage which can pretty much take out any of our heroes or at least put them at a near crippled state. So you do have to make sure you understand the difference here. You're going to roll a save for every single hit. So let's say for example a bad guy rolls two dice and manages to hit one of our heroes twice. That means our hero gets to make two attempts to save. Now it doesn't matter if each one of these hits perform one point of damage or ten points of damage, you're going to save per hit. Now to make a hit save, you're simply going to roll a die and you need to roll your save value or higher to make a successful dodge on that attack. So our plucky little misweaver right here rolled a six. Our save value is a six. We would be able to dodge this attack and then we get to make a save versus the other attack that hit us. And again, if we roll a six or higher, we're going to successfully dodge that attack. If we do not roll our save, we're going to take however much damage that enemy is going to perform against us. Whether it happens to be one wound, two wounds, or it can be up to ten wounds. Well, pretty close if you ever run into a death deal. You're going to feel like it's ten wounds. But whatever that may be, you're going to take that many wounds if you don't successfully dodge that attack. So let's say our magical enemy that has managed to attack us, attacked us, and each one of these attacks did three points of damage. We successfully dodged the first attack. We did not successfully dodge the second attack, so we would take three wounds. We would simply put three skulls onto our hero sheet. I like to start from the left and going all the way from the right because I always put my dice from smallest to the highest going left to right, and that's very, very important you understand later as you start playing the game because if you happen to have a die in a location and you take a wound, that wound will actually remove that die, especially if your slots are completely full. So to show you how that works is if our hero, for example, looked like this, and I happen to have two dice available for me on my turn, and if I manage to take a wound, I would actually lose that die without being able to spend it. So just a little pro tip, keep your dice lowest to highest, and remove your dice left to right, and you add wounds from left to right just to show you how that happens. But to finish up, our plucky little hero was hit by this bad guy, took three points of damage, that means on their turn they would only have access to one die, unless another hero who was a healer managed to activate before them, and managed to remove some of these wounds, and then we get to roll that many dice when our turn came back around. For example, if we got healed for two, we would still get to roll three action dice on our turn. That's how all the action dice worked for our heroes. That's how the saves works. That's all the statistics. Now let's show you, let me show you how to set up the game. Now as you're setting up the game, one important thing you want to make sure you do before you start the game is make sure you organize all these miniatures by weapon type. Now there should be two of every single miniature adversary with every single weapon and you will want to set them up in this way because it's going to help speed up the gameplay as you play the game because the way you're going to pull these miniatures on the board is going to be based on weapon type. I'm going to explain to you how that works when we get to that point but it'll help make things much much quicker. You're going to see for example when we get over to the acolytes you're going to see there's two with a shield, two with the sword, you're going to see there's two with the glaive, you're going to see that there's two with a dual wielding. For example you want to put them in a row like that that way you can pull them out very quickly because when you add adversaries to the board, you can never add the same equipped adversary to the board until you have all unique adversaries. So for example, to explain what that means in simpler terms, let's say you ran into an encounter where you had to add six of these acolytes onto the board, where your first four acolytes are going to be the unique weapons. So you're going to get one acolyte with a shield, one with a large sword, the one with a glaive, and one who is dual wielding. Once you have all four of those out, now you can start adding duplicate advocates or acolytes onto the board and you pick from any of the remaining ones, it doesn't matter because once you have all uniques, then you can start picking duplicates. So for example, the Grotlings right here over here, you see that there's four different kind of Grotlings. If you had an encounter that only had three of them, they have to be all three unique weapons. If you had an encounter with six of them, you put out four of the unique weapons, and then you can start adding out the duplicates. And that goes for all of our enemies. They're all equipped slightly differently. But just to make your life easier, make sure you organize them like that. That way you can add them to the board and take them off very, very quickly. 
Now, at the start of the game, every single one of our players needs to pick a player color. We have red, ivory, blue, and black. You're going to take your renowned tracker that matches whatever hero dice color you pick, and you put it on the circle at the top of the renowned tracker. So if we happen to be playing a three-player game, one player will pick red, one player will pick ivory, and then one player will pick the blue. If we only have a three-hero game, the last adventurer and their tokens and everything will be removed from the board. They will not be used. And I'm just going to show you how to play a three-player game here really quick because it's pretty efficient to show you that. Once we have completed that, all the players are going to take the dice matching the color they chose at the start of the game, match the renowned token, and then we're going to shuffle up all the treasure cards, put them over here on the purple side, and then we're going to shuffle up all the skill cards and put them over on the blue side of the board. Once we have completed that, all the players need to pick their hero they're going to go through this adventure with. Now, if a player picks the War Priest, they must also take the Griffhound, because the Griffhound always goes with the War Priest. If one player decides to pick the Fire Slayer Doom Seeker, they must also take the Fire Rune. Beyond that, the players just simply take their adventure sheet, place it over on their little section wherever they want to play, and then the next thing we are going to do is we are going to start doing a little thematic reading. Now again, I said earlier I'm going to do a little bit of glossing over because I do want some of the surprises to come through the game. But basically what is going to happen is you're going to pick a player who's going to start off as the rune mark player. The rune mark player is basically the person who's going to do all the reading. They're the person who's going to control all the adversaries and they're the person who's going to start the round. The rune mark player is going to rotate at the end of every single round. So all the players are going to get a chance to control the adversaries potentially do some reading, but this is going to control who controls those actions during the round. So we'll start off with the Shard, who will be the Rune Mark player at the start of the game, and they will simply open the rule book to the page number one, and they're going to read Starting the Trial. If the heroes win the trial, they're also going to read Ending the Trial, but this is going to give them instructions on how they are going to set up the adventure. Now, what you need to do is you need to follow the instructions on that, but the very first adventure that our heroes are always going to take when they start the campaigns, they're going to start the campaign part for the part of the amulet that has the white circle with the, I'm sorry, the white symbol with the circle inside it. And there's a name for that rune. Every single one of these runes has a name on it. I don't have it memorized, so I'm not going to be able to say it. It's listed in the book. Once you've picked out which part of the amulet you're going to be working on, you will need to go through this complete deck of all the rooms involved. And you're going to have to find all the rooms that have that matching symbol. Now, some of these rooms will be involved in multiple scenarios. For example, this room, the librarian, is only going to be involved if you're going after the part of the amulet that has the matching symbol. You'll see that the symbol here matches the symbol, so we know that this room is going to be worked on if we're going through this adventure. If we're going through this adventure, we'll also see this room is involved, but if we're also, at a later date, happen to be going after this part of the amulet, we would know we'd build the adventure deck with this room also. We will continue to go through the entire deck and find all the rooms that have the symbol matching the part of the amulet we're working on. Now the first adventure is going to be seven rooms because there's seven cards that all have this matching symbol on them. You'll find all seven of those rooms and the rest of the room cards you will remove from the game because you will not need them. And then at this point, just to make your life easier, go through all the stack of the room tiles and find all the room tiles that happen to match all these pictures and set them off to the side. All the rest of the room tiles will not be used so you can simply remove them from the game. You will not have to worry about them. And then the adventure instructions are going to tell you how to set up this deck and any special instructions you'll need to have. You'll follow those instructions and then you'll place those cards right down on the board. You'll place the entrance into the dungeon right in front of it. The yellow is entrance further into the dungeon. The blue was the way we came in and the way we can never leave again until we complete this entire adventure. So once we have performed that, the rune mark player will start by taking their hero, adding their hero next to the entrance further into the dungeon then the other players in player order will simply add their heroes on to any open space on the board. And then we have set up the basic start of the game. We're ready to proceed further into the adventure. Warhammer Quest Silver Tower is played out over rounds, and every single round is broken down into four phases. The start of every round starts with the destiny phase. Then we're going to move to the hero phase, finally the adversary phase, and then finally we're going to move all the way over to the end phase. And there's a nice reference sheet at the back of the rulebook. Again, I photocopy mine just for simplicity, but it does list it all right here. Round sequence, destiny, hero, adversary, and end phase. Now, the start of every single round, the rune mark player, again, this is going to rotate at the end of every single round during the end phase, but I'm getting ahead of myself, but the rune mark player at the start of every single round for the destiny phase is going to roll the destiny dice. Now, there are five purple destiny dice involved in the game, and that's actually a fantastic destiny roll right there. But there's five destiny dice in the game, and the rune mark player needs to roll all five of these destiny dice. 
Now the results on these dice are going to possibly cause a couple of different things to happen. But there's one caveat to that. At the very start of the game, before any of the heroes have started exploring the dungeon at all, which means all the heroes are still on the entrance, when we roll the destiny dice, there cannot be any negatives on the very first round. From all future rounds after that, it's fair game. Any bad rolls on the destiny dice, the heroes are going to have to suffer through. But for the very first round, we're perfectly safe. Now, the way the destiny dice will work is a room art player is going to roll all of the destiny dice, and they're going to look for any unique dice, which means it's a face that is not matched by any other dice. So in this example roll I've rolled right here, I do have two duplicates, so those are not unique dice. They will be pulled out of the game for this round, but we do have a unique three, a unique four, and a unique five. And we'll simply add these over to the renowned board over here on these little blue spaces that you probably can't see from this camera, but just know that there are five blue spaces and there are two purple spaces. We will add the renowned dice, I'm sorry, the destiny dice, onto the renowned board as long as they happen to be unique numbers. Any duplicates, triplicates, quadruplicates, or quintuplets are going to be removed for the round and we're going to suffer various effects based on whatever those dice happen to be showing on their face. And the way this will work, and there's a nice reminder at the back of the book, is if we happen to roll the destiny dice and all the dice have to be showing the same faces, forcing them all removed, not all the exact same face. So for example, if we happen to have two ones, and then we happen to have three fours, which means there are no unique dice left in the destiny pool at all, we're going to suffer a unique event that is going to happen. Now, this is going to be based on whether we get all unique matching dice. Now, let me back phrase, backtrack here a little bit. This is going to be based on if these dice all have to be different pairs, if you want to think of poker terms, or if we want to get all matching dice. So if we have a pair of twos and three fours, we will remove all these dice and we'll have the effects of fickle fate, which means all the heroes are going to heal D3 wounds. Remember, D3, 1 to 2 is a 1, 3 to 4 is a 2, a 5 to 6 is a 3. Now, if all five of these dice happen to match the exact same facing, so if we would roll, for example, five fours, we would still remove all the dice because we do not have any unique dice left over, and then we're going to get an extra special benefit for rolling all these dice showing the exact same facing. All the heroes will get to heal D3 wounds, and then all the heroes are going to gain one skill. Again, this only happens if all five dice show the same face. If we happen to have a pair and then a three of a kind, though, we're simply going to remove all the dice and our heroes will only get to heal. Now, there's a couple other results that we can also get. If we ever get a pair of ones, we will get an unexpected event, which means we are going to roll the dice and we will consult the adventure book. And we're going to get a paragraph out of the adventure book based on the roll of the dice and we're going to roll the dice like a tens and a ones so we would take one of the white dice and one of the purple dice and we'd say the white will be the tens place and the purple will be the ones place we'll roll and we will get a six and a five which will be a 65 and we'll simply flip the book until we see entry number 65 and we'll read the thematic text and do exactly what the text tells us to do we will do that if we roll all ones or double ones or if we happen to roll double sixes. We'll also have to do that if it happens to be triple sixes and even if it happens to be quadruple sixes or quadruple ones. It doesn't matter. As long as we have at least one unique destiny die, we're not going to have the fickle hand of fate effect that's quite that badly. But again, if it happened to be all sixes like this example, then we'd get the heal and we'd also get the free skill. And if it happened to be something like this, then we'd just get the free heal only. Now, if we roll ones and remove ones, or if we remove sixes, we will get the unexpected event. But if we get twos that we pull out of the pool, threes that we pull out of the pools, four that we pull out of the pool, or if we get fives that we pull out of the pool, we're going to add one of these little minions on the board, and they have extra special powers. They're going to do extra different things, and they're going to affect our heroes in various special kinds of ways. Now, I don't want to ruin the surprise on some of the things they will do, because some of the things they do are kind of unique, but they're all listed in the book, and our heroes can try to capture these minions for a boon, but if they fail to capture these minions, they're going to suffer a penalty. As long as this little minion is on the board, he is going to have a constant effect on the board as long as he happens to be on the board. And if we pick him up successfully, that hero will add him onto his adventure sheet, and then we can spend him for various kinds of benefits, boons, if we like, or we can keep him on our hero sheet for quite a while and carry him over for multiple rounds as long as another effect doesn't cause one of these guys to be added onto the board. 
because you will notice there's only two of every single minion available in the game. There's two of this little guy right here, two of the fish guy, two of the book guy, and two of the little moon face guy. If we ever have a situation where one of our heroes has already captured one and we need to add another one to the board, we are fine. If a hero captures a second one and no hero can capture the same one twice, we're still fine. But if an event causes one of these guys to get added to the board again, one of our heroes, if they haven't spent him, must discard that minion and add him back onto the board. But one thing to understand is there can never be two of the same minion on the board at the same time. So if we get an event that causes two of the same minion to be added to the board, we never add the second minion. And if we already have both the minions already taken up, we need to add one. One of the players is going to lose that minion and he'll be added onto the board. Now these little minions are always added as close to the center or whatever it may say on the text here. Just follow the text. It'll tell you exactly how to add those minions onto the board. And again, they have various effects. And that's part of the destiny phase. That's part of the fickleness of destiny and the dice. After the destiny phase, we come to the hero phase. And every single hero phase will start with the current rune mark player. And in player order, we're basically going to go clockwise. The players have one of two options. They can decide to take their turn and they're going to roll their action dice and perform some actions based on the dice they roll or they can decide to pass. Now the trick here with passing is it can help you shuffle up the play order somewhat, but the trick here is you can only pass one time. So for example, if the room mark player decide that they are going to pass for their turn, then the Dark Oath Chieftain, since they're in clockwise order, will get the chance to either pass or take their action. Let's say they pass also, and then we will go to the Night Quester. They can decide to pass or take their action. They decide to take the turn, they will roll their dice. If they, whatever the quester does, we are now back to the Tenebra Shard, who cannot pass again. They have to take their action again, because you're only allowed to pass once per round. So we can slightly adjust the play order by using that, but you can only do it so much, and it doesn't allow you to totally reorder the play order. But just understand that you can take your action, or you can decide to pass. If a player decides that they will take their action, they will take all four of their Destiny Dice if they are unwounded, if they happen to have any wounds at all, they will take as many destiny or end as many action dice as they have open slots. So, for example, if we happen to have two wounds, we would only get to roll two action dice. If we happen to have one wound and one stun token, we would still only take two dice. Because stun markers take up one of our action dice slots, even though stun markers disappear at the end of that player's action phase, assuming they actually take the action phase by rolling their action dice. So let's say our Tenebral Shard here, for this example, happens to have one stun marker on them. That means they will get three dice to roll for their action. If they had no injuries on them at all and no stun tokens, they will get to roll all four of their action dice. Once we roll all four of our action dice, we're simply going to place them on the slots. And again, I like to place them from left to right, from smallest to largest, and then we can start discarding these dice to perform various actions. Now, every one of our heroes has actions that is unique to that specific hero, and they're all going to be listed on the action card for every one of our heroes, whether it's weapon actions or special actions that is unique to that specific hero. They all have those actions. And again, like I described earlier, we will simply discard dice that have that minimum value to perform that action. But on top of that, all of our heroes have a group of actions that is able to be performed by all of our heroes, and these are actions shareable by all of our heroes, meaning they can take these actions on their turn if they like. Now the very first action you can perform is you can spend a die that has a value of 1 or higher to explore an unexplored edge of your current room. If you decide to explore the current edge, you will simply flip over the top card and you will look at this card, you will read everything this card tells you to perform, and you will add that tile onto the board. And again, you can add that tile in any orientation you like. So, for example, some rooms allow you to have multiple exits. You can connect this to the prior tile any way you like. For example, I can place it like this, or I can place it like this. It's up to the party to decide, but the person who's taking the current turn gets to make the ultimate decision, or you can let the room mark player make the ultimate decision. It's up to you, whatever you like to do. But after you add the board tile to the current board, based on whatever orientation you decide you want to choose, you're going to place this card next to that board section and leave it next to that board section as long as this board is part of the game board. And then any remaining cards that you have not flipped over are going to be moved to the current exit for that board. Now you have to be very careful here because if you flip over a board section that has multiple exits, such as this tile location right here, you would place this onto the map however you want to orient it, like I said earlier, and then you need to divide this stack of face-down cards up among the remaining exits. 
and you're going to do that by placing the cards from the bottom of the stack first, one at a time at every single exit. So in this example, we place one tile down or one card down, one card down, and again, we're going to continue doing this from the bottom of the stack until every single card has been placed at one of the exits. That way, these exits continue to grow the board, and we're now shuffling up the board, shuffling up the locations, and shuffling up exactly how this adventure is going to lay out. After we have divvied up the cards, that is going to cause us to perform various actions based on whatever this card tells us to do. And generally what it'll do is it may be a trap, it may be an encounter, or it may actually ask you to make a roll on the adversary encounter table. Now to make a roll on the adversary encounter table, you simply pick the table it tells you to pick, and then you can roll either a d6 or you can roll 2d6 and add the dice together to get a result. So you get a result anywhere from 2 all the way up to 12 if you're rolling two six-siders, or anywhere from 1 to 6 if you're just rolling one six-sider. It'll tell you exactly what to do, and you may get an unexpected event, which means you're going to roll two dice, one being the tens, one being the ones place, or it's going to tell you to add a certain amount of adversaries to the board based on the hero count, not the player count. It happens to be the hero count. So if you're playing one player controlling four heroes. That means you're going to add as many adversaries as if you had four heroes on the board. You're not going to go ahead and make the game any easier on you than you really need to, even though it does say players. You're going to add one per hero, not per player. The next common action which is available to all of our heroes on their turn beyond their special abilities that is unique to each one of our heroes is the ability to move. And again, you just need to discard one die that happens to show a facing of a one or higher perform the move. And when you perform the move, you're going to move as many spaces as your movement allowance based on every one of our heroes, which can be anywhere from three all the way up to five for the Griff Hand or various different levels based on if you want to pull in heroes from any of the other games in the Age of Sigmar but you simply can move into any adjacent space. Now you have to be careful when you look at some of these spaces because you're going to see that they're not always perfectly aligned and that's intentional when they design the game. Some rooms are meant to be more hazardous and more treacherous, so you can't move exactly into some of these squares unless they happen to be touching. And again, diagonal movement is allowed. So for example, this room right here, you'll see that some of the squares aren't perfectly aligned, so you do have to watch how your movement goes. But you can move as many spaces based on your total movement allowance. So, for example, the Tenebral Shard can move up to four spaces. Our Dark Oath Chieftain can move up to three spaces. Our Night Quester can also move up to three spaces. And you simply spend one die. Okay, I already spent that one for the Explore action, which I forgot to do. So we simply spend a die, and we'll move as many spaces as our movement. So one, two, three, and again, we have to watch these squares perfectly. Four, and that would be our complete movement. Now, the nice thing about all these common actions is you can perform the same action multiple times. So I could discard another die to perform another move, taking me up to this portal right here, and then I can spend this remaining die right here to go ahead and perform another explore action. Our explore deck would be located right here. I would simply flip over the next deck in the explore section. I would add that tile onto the map however I liked, making sure to keep the card next to that tile, and then in this example, I would need to split up all the remaining locations among the remaining exits, and then I would spawn whatever it happens to be set on this text card. If it tells me to make a roll on the encounter table, I'll do so. If it says something special is going to happen, I just need to make sure I follow the text on the card and add any minions onto the board or any adversaries onto the board. Now, when we add adversaries onto the board, we want to put them as close to the center as possible. And the room marked player is the one who's going to add them to the board. And if there's any ambiguities or possibilities for multiple locations for any adversaries to appear, it's up to the room marked player to decide. So in this example, if we had to add four adversaries to the board, I could add one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, something like that, just as long as it's as close to the center as possible. So the next action we can do, we've covered exploring, we've ex covered movement. The next thing we can do is we can perform a healing action. Now healing is very interesting, and healing is going to have a sliding scale on how much it costs to heal for one of our heroes. The first time we perform a heal action on our turn, we must discard a die with a minimum value of one. If we do so, we simply remove one wound from our hero. The next time we want to heal in a round, and remember, we can perform these actions multiple times. We perform movement multiple times. We explore, perform exploration multiple times. We can also perform healing multiple times. But the second time we heal, we must discard a die with a value of two. If we do so, we can remove that second wound from our hero. To heal a third time, we need to discard a die with a minimum value of three and then we can remove that wound. And if we happen to have four wounds in our hero, yes, we can discard a die with a value of four to remove that fourth wound. 
Now you're asking yourself, if I have four wounds and I don't have any action dice available to me, how the heck can I heal? And this is a great time to explain how the destiny dice work in this game. See, at the start of every single round, like I said, we are going to roll the destiny dice. And the destiny dice is a common pool of dice that's available to all of our heroes with a couple different limits to make sure that one player does not hog all the destiny dice. The way this will work is if it's your turn, there's any destiny dice available, you have access to all of those dice. You simply pick one of the dice and you will take it for its face value. So for example, if I wanted to use a die that had a value of three or higher, I would simply take that die and then spend it as its current face value to do any special ability I may want to do, such as in this example, maybe use it to heal. The trick is every time you take a destiny die from the destiny tile board, you must lock the remaining highest destiny value die. So since I took this three and there's still a six available, I must lock the six by moving down into the purple section of the board here. I still have access to the remaining three destiny dice though. So if I would take this five because I wanted to perform a special ability that required me to spend a five or more, I must now again lock the highest remaining destiny die, which would be a four in this example, which means I still have access to this two. Now at the end of this hero's turn, any destiny dice that are locked will unlock and will be available to the next player in hero order, unless you happen to be the last hero to activate on this hero phase. If you are the last hero to activate on this hero fa phase, then you do not lock any of the destiny dice and any remaining destiny dice are available to you. Now there's also companions that are available in this game and I'm not going to explain any of them. Be at this point right here, I'm going to explain them towards the end of the video where I'm going to explain what the different amulets can be used for and extra special rules for the game. I'm just trying to explain the basic rules of the game. But just understand the companions are going to act a little bit differently so the last hero in player order is the one who has access to all remaining destiny dice. Now before we go on to the adversary phase, which happens after every single hero phase, I just want to explain one more thing about movement, so now that you've seen all the actions that are available to you. When it comes to movement, any hero can always move through another hero, they just cannot land on a space with another hero. There can only be one miniature per space on the board. So if we happen to have a situation right here at this current circumstances, we could have this hero move through this space, move through this space, and since this is diagonal and adjacent, we can move to this space. That is a perfectly legal movement. The trick here is, is that heroes can never move through adversaries and adversaries can never move through heroes, but adversaries can always move through each other. So this adversary could move through this adversary and end up on this space like that, but this adversary cannot move through here, here to end up back here to end up behind this hero right here. There's one caveat to that because again, this game does have a couple exceptions to the rules and that's gonna be the Griff Hound. Now the Griff Hound can move through heroes and it can also move through adversaries. It's a small little creature. It's very deft and it can move through both adversaries and heroes which is a nice bonus of the Griff Hound. So when it comes to movement, heroes can move through heroes, adversaries can move through adversaries. They can't move through each other unless you happen to be the plucky little Griff Hound which can allow you to move through both. And the other thing to understand is when it comes to these little familiars, I think I called them minions earlier but they're called familiars, a hero can move through a familiar to a point because if they move through a space that has a familiar on it they have to actually stop their movement on that familiar space and they have to try to capture that familiar and then suffer the repercussions of that familiar so for example if I spent my movement and I moved right here I must now attempt to capture this familiar whether I'm successful or not is gonna have some repercussions again that's listed on the back of the rule book just make sure you follow what it says and I'll tell you exactly what to do when it comes to these familiars so heroes can move into a space with a familiar it ends their movement. They cannot move into spaces with adversaries. And again, I explain the rest of the movement. That's the end of our hero phase. The next thing that I'm explaining to you is going to be the adversary phase. The adversary phase is going to be different based on whether it happens to be any adversaries on the board or not. Now, remember earlier I told you there's two different versions of the respite rules. I'm going to explain to you how the basic original version of the respite rules work. Then I'm going to explain to you the errated version of the respite rules. You can decide which version you like. I suggest the errata rules until you play the game a couple times, then you may start to appreciate the original version of the rules. That is completely up to you. But the original version of the errata rules state that at the beginning of any adversary phase, if there are no adversaries on the board, you are going to have a respite. It's automatic. You don't have a choice. You can't decide not to have a respite phase. You have to do it. If you have a respite phase because there's no adversaries on the board, the current rune mark player is going to pick up a six-sider and they're going to roll it. 
and they're going to add up the total amount of skills gained by the entire party up to this point. So for example, the Knight Quester happened to have three current skills, the Dark Oath Chieftain currently had one skill, and our Tenebral Shard currently had one skill. That would be a total of five skills among the party. We'll add the total amount of skills to the roll of the die. If we manage to get a nine or higher, we are going to be ambushed. And the way you have an ambush is you'll simply roll on encounter table number D, set up the monsters as if you have just ran into them by opening another room, except the heroes do not get to react. We are going to have a full encounter and counting whatever monsters will come into the room. And these monsters are going to come into the room at whatever current exit is currently still available to be explored. Now, if there are no exits left to be explored, we will simply have them start spawning near the closest to the nearest portal. Now, if we have multiple exits, they will spawn next to the exit that's close to the, closest to the current rune marked player. Now, if we do not have a successful ambush, we will simply move on to the rest of the respite phase where our heroes will get a chance to heal or they get a chance to search for treasures. Now, of course, if there's no ambush that happens to our heroes, they get a chance, like I said, they get a chance to heal, and they also possibly get a chance to search for a treasure. And that's going to be up to in each individual hero to decide. If they decide to heal, they cannot search for treasure. If they search for treasure, they cannot decide to heal. And the way this is going to work is if they decide to heal, they're going to roll a six-sider, and they roll a one or two, they'll heal one wound. Three to four, they heal two wounds. If they roll a five to six, they get to heal three wounds. But if they decide that they do not want to heal, they can search for a treasure. To search for a treasure, we simply roll a six-sider. If we roll a four, five, or six, we get to draw the top treasure from the treasure deck and add it into our pool. Remember, no hero can have more than four treasures. Treasures can be shared among the players if they happen to be adjacent to each other, and they can also be shared at the end of every single round among the heroes. But you can only make the choice of searching for the treasure, or you can only make the choice of healing if that's what you want to do. Also, if we start a respite phase, and again, that can only happen if there's no adversaries on the board, before we roll on the random encounter table to see if we're ambushed, all the heroes will be allowed to rearrange their heroes on the current chamber any way they want. So they can place their heroes next to exits if they like, or however they wish to do it. But again, they get to do that before the respite, or I'm sorry, before the ambush roll. Then we'll make the roll to see if there will be an ambush. If there is, we'll roll on the ambush table. If there's no ambush, we get to decide if we want to heal or if we want to roll for the treasure. Now the modified version of the rules changes how this works just ever so slightly. If there's no adversaries on the board at the start of the adversary phase, we will have a respite. Again, it's mandatory. We do not have the option. We have to have the respite phase. And then what is going to happen is every single hero individually is going to roll a six-sided die. If there any one of the heroes, even just one of the heroes, rolls less than the current amount of skills that specific hero has, then there will be the ambush. So for example, if the Knight Quester has three skills and the Dark Oath Chieftain only has one skill and the Tenebral Shard has zero skills, well, we know that's impossible for the Tenebral Shard to roll less than zero. It's impossible for the Dark Oath Chieftain to roll less than one. So potentially the only person who can cause an ambush would be the Knight Quester if they rolled a one or a two if they had three skills because they have to roll less than their personal amount of skills. But other than that, the respite works exactly the same. If there's no adversaries on the board, the heroes will arrange themselves anywhere they want on the current chamber, and the current chamber is always a chamber that has the most heroes on it, but we're going to rearrange ourselves however we want on the current chamber, then we're going to roll to see if there's an ambush. There is an ambush, we're going to roll on encounter table number D. Those adversaries will now activate and we'll have to fight those adversaries, but if we don't have an encounter because we roll well enough, or if the dice roll is in our favor for some lucky random amount of fate, then we get the choice to either heal the D3 wounds or we can search for the treasure by rolling a 4 or higher. But let's say we're not going to have a lucky respite. Let's say that there's currently adversaries on the board. Let's go ahead and show you exactly how it works with encounters when we have adversaries. Show you how combat works and just show you how exciting Silver Tower can be. If we have an adversary phase where there happens to be multiple adversaries on the board, we are not going to get a chance to perform the respite. What's going to happen is all the adversaries are going to activate and they're going to be controlled by the current rune mark player. And the way this is going to work is the current rune mark player picks a group of adversaries to start with. Now, all these adversaries are broken down into various groups, and they are listed in the rule book here, and I'm not going to, or in the guidebook, it's all going to show all the statistics and the abilities and everything for all these various different creatures. And basically, I don't want to ruin this too much. I just want to explain to you that you want to make sure you're familiar with all these adversaries because they all act differently. They all have special abilities that are going to activate at certain times, especially the Gaunt Summoner. 
especially the large creature right here and all these different creatures, they all have different special abilities that are going to activate at very special times, especially the Death Runner who is very unique and especially how he works. So make sure you read up on exactly how that all works out. But what the current Runemark player is going to do is they're going to pick one group of adversaries to start with and they will roll on the behavior table. Now the behavior table will either be a d6 or maybe a 2d6 where you can add it together and that's going to tell you which kind of behavior that adversary is going to perform. And again, those decisions are all made by the room mark player. They will follow out whatever that adversary group tells them to perform based on the behavior table. And then the room mark player will pick the next adversary group because we have three groups in this example right here. We have this group right here, we have this group right here, and then we have this group right here. But the room mark player will pick out the next group, roll on that group's behavior table, perform whatever it tells them to do, and then when that's accomplished, we'll move on to the final adversary group. Again, roll on that table and perform those behaviors. Now, all of our adversaries have three statistics. They'll have a movement statistic, tells you how many squares they'll move. They'll have an agility statistic, which allows them to perform a breakaway, much like when the heroes try to break away from an adversary. When an adversary tries to break away from a hero, they must also make a roll on a six-header to see if they can beat, their, beat or beat their agility to move away from that hero. If they're unable to do so, they have to stay next to that hero because they do not perform a successful breakaway. And also, every one of our adversaries has a vigor statistic instead of an armor save. Basically, anytime we do damage to an adversary, they do not get an armor save. They take that many points of damage. If they take damage equal to the vigor, again, unless they have special abilities such as this adversary right here, they take damage equal to their vigor, they are defeated, they are removed from the board, and whichever hero performed the killing blow, again, it's emphasis on the killing blow, not damage, but whoever performs a killing blow will earn one point of renown on the renown track. If a hero ever manages to do a complete circle on the renown track by circling all the way around the board and coming all the way back to the circle, they will have effectively leveled up. They will draw two skill cards, read both these skill cards, pick one to keep, and the other one's going to go at the bottom of that deck of cards, and they'll keep that skill card for the rest of this specific adventure. Now, whether they're going to keep this skill for further adventures is going to be based on whatever the book tells you to do because it does have that section at the end of the trial, and I don't want to ruin what happens, but I'm going to tell you that you may not keep all your skills. You may not keep all of your treasures. It's going to be based on however many of these amulet pieces you've managed to acquire and just also the luck and the randomness of the dice. So just understand that you may not want to try to keep too many of these treasures because you may not be able to carry them on through further adventures. Same thing with the skills. Even though the skills... There are permanent abilities as long as you keep them between adventures, whereas certain items may tell you you can only use them one time, two times, or there's a chance you may lose them based on the roll of a dice. But just also understand, like I mentioned before, no single hero is allowed to have more than four treasure cards on that hero at any single time, even between adventures. So that's exactly how the adversary phase is going to work out. There's just one minor thing to explain to you, and that's line of sight, like I said, I explained earlier when it comes to combat. Now, when it comes to combat, the way line of sight is going to work for missile attacks and also for area attacks, this is very important. For missile attacks, you're simply going to draw a line of sight from the center of the square of the current hero to the target you're trying to attack. The only thing that ever blocks line of sight are obstructions, and obstructions are sometimes on these different locations across the board. For example, this location right here, you're going to see that there's a pillar in the center of the board it's outlined in black, and when you pull up the specific room card, it's going to be highlighted in red so you make sure that you can see it. So in this example, if a hero was standing here and the target was here, they will not have line of sight because they draw through an obstruction so they could not see each other. But if we look at this example right here, we would have perfect line of sight because there's no obstructions between our heroes. There's no walls blocking our line of sight, and we can draw from center to center because open portals are perfectly acceptable because these squares are considered 100% adjacent between these openings and these doorways. So we would have line of sight there for any kind of missile attack. Also for area attacks, the area attacks specify that they're going to attack every single thing that's on the current chamber with whichever hero or adversary is using that special ability. So for example, if the Teneba Shard was at this chamber right here and they use an area effect ability, it would not affect anybody here because area effects attack everything in your current chamber. Whereas opposed, if this chieftain right here used an area effect attack, he would affect everything in his current chamber except for his fellow heroes. And the way you'll do that is you roll one die for every single target. So you basically say, after this one, I'll roll for this one, and then I'll roll for this one, and then I'll roll for this one. 
Same thing for the adversaries. For example, some of these guys have special abilities that will attack the entire room. So they'll roll once for every single hero, and they will follow the results, again, based on the behavior table. That will tell you exactly what is going to happen. And again, I don't want to ruin the behavior table because part of that is exploring and seeing how these different adversary groups act up. Just make sure you understand that the Zangers do have a special beak attack, which is very, very important. Understand that Gaunt Summer has a lot of special abilities. Make sure you read his entire page. Make sure you read the entire page for this adversary right here because he has special abilities, especially when he starts taking lots of damage. The Death Runners also have special abilities, so make sure you make yourself very familiar with every one of these villains when you first encounter them so you understand how they work, understand that usually they're going to die when they take enough damage equal to the vigor, and also understand they're going to behave differently based on a behavior table role. After the adversary phase, we move over to the end phase of every single turn. Now during the end phase, two things are going to happen. Well, one is going to happen, the other one's potentially going to happen. The very first thing that's going to happen is a rune mark player is going to move in clockwise order, and the next player in clockwise order will become the next rune mark player. Again, the rune mark player starts every single turn by either taking the first action, or of course we can always pass if we like. The rune mark player controls all the adversaries, and the rune mark player gets to make some other decisions throughout the game based on specific scenarios, and again, it'll be listed. Don't want to give away too many spoilers here, but just to understand the rune mark player does get some extra special things that will happen to him even in the very first adventure. Again, a little bit of a spoiler, but not too much for you. Now, additionally, after the Rumark player moves, there is a potential chance that the dungeon is going to start falling apart. And the way this is going to work is if we have it to happen to have a dungeon that is built up to a certain specific size, following chambers that are too far behind the adventurers are going to start disappearing from the board. And this can be very bad for our heroes if they happen to be on any of those chambers. So you always have your current chamber, and any chambers that are more than two spaces away from the current chamber are going to disappear during the end phase. And if any heroes happen to be on that chamber when it disappears from the board, they are going to be grievously wounded, which means they will be removed from the board. And again, I'll be explaining grievous wounds here very, very shortly. Just wait one moment. I haven't forgotten about it yet. But that board section will be removed, and if any heroes happen to be on that board section, they will be grievously wounded. So if we continue to advance the board by continuing to explore throughout the adventures by flipping over additional board sections, oh, that's a bad selection right there. If we happen to start exploring, continuing to explore, moving further and further into the dungeon, and as the current chamber moves further and further into the dungeon, that means any chambers that are further away are going to continue to be removed from the board as we explore further into the dungeon during every single end phase. And again, any heroes that are on that chamber tile will be grievously wounded. Now, the way a hero who is grievously wounded, there's two different ways you can be grievously wounded in this game. The first way is if you ever have four wounds and you're forced to take a fifth wound, your hero is grievously wounded and they're removed from the board, but they're not removed from the game. The other way is just as I explained during the end phase, if you're on a board section that's popped off the board, you will also be grievously wounded. Now, the only way you can return to the board if you're grievously wounded is during a respite. And I've explained to you how respites work. And I did miss one thing earlier about the respites, and I'm going to explain to you that right now. And that is the fact that you can never have two respite phases in a row ever in this game. If it ever happens, something bad is going to happen to our heroes. And that's a good time to explain to you why you want to be constantly exploring and constantly advancing this game, because not only is the board falling apart behind you, if you fail to continue to advance and you're forced to have two respite phases in a row, something bad is going to happen to our party. Instead of having the second respite phase, an unexpected event is going to happen to our heroes. And if you ever forget what an expected event is, I explained it earlier to you. But it's over here on this section of the board, basically you're going to roll a die as a tens place and a die as a ones place. Pull out the adventure book and see exactly what is going to happen to our heroes. There's also another way you can have an unexpected event while there are adversaries on the board. If there's ever a time where you need to add adversaries to the board and you do not have any of those models available, for example, if you happen to have all the Grot Scutlings on the board, and for some reason you need to add more, or for some reason you add miniatures onto the board, but you don't have any miniatures represented with the base set, you're also going to have an unexpected event. Now there's a couple different rules for the game that I haven't covered, and I kind of want to leave them as surprises for the rest of the heroes. I do want to cover two other things though before we go and just give you a rough overview of the rules I'm not covering, just so you know where to look, and you will want to look into those once you have further adventures into the dungeon. The first thing I do want to definitely cover, though, is stun. Now, when it comes to combat, if a hero is ever stunned, you're going to simply place a stun marker on that hero's board in one of their spots 
That's the only effect that's going to have. And at the end of that hero's activation, that stun marker will disappear. Now, if a hero ever has a stun marker and they take a wound, they're not going to add additional wounds onto the board unless they need to for excessive amounts of wounds. And what I mean by that, for example, let's say the Tenebral Shard already has one wound and one stun marker. If they get hit by an enemy who does two points damage, there's somebody who can convert the stun marker into one point of damage, and then they'll add the second point of damage onto their hero. But let's say they get hit by a very weak creature that only does one point of damage. They're simply going to convert the stun marker into a point of damage. They're not going to add a damage token. Stun marker is basically kind of an inconvenience, but they're not too terrible for you. And as a matter of fact, if a hero ever has four wounds on them and they're forced to take a stun marker, you actually get to ignore it. A stun can never force you to get grievously wounded. Only an actual wound causing that fifth wound can cause you to be grievously wounded and pull your hero off of the board. That's the only thing you need to worry about there also. Also, one other thing to understand about the game is no single die can ever be re-rolled a second time. So there are going to be abilities in the game that will say roll your die all over again or roll the destiny dice again or pick certain dice and re-roll them again. Now the rules are very concrete on this specific aspect. Even if you have multiple abilities that give you multiple re-rolls, only one die can ever be rolled one time only. You have to take the results of the second roll even if it's less advantageous for you. So if you have multiple abilities that say re-roll your dice for this, Reroll your dice for this. It doesn't matter. Each die can only be rerolled one single time. Now, there's a couple different rules I am not going to cover. They're in the rule book, and I want them to be a surprise. You experience the game, and there's a lot of theme in this game. The first thing is that when you have your first amulet, and when you start gaining more amulets, every one of these amulets has special powers that you can activate once per adventure to get various benefits for you. So the more amulet pieces you have, the more you can have these help you as the adventures get more difficult. Also, you may occasionally throughout your explorations run into various different companions who are going to join your party. Now companions are only going to stay with your party for a very limited amount of time. They have very limited abilities and they cannot use destiny dice but basically every one of these companions will be re represented by a hero card and they will also get action dice to roll and that's why we get these extra white dice and everything like that but they're not nearly as powerful as our heroes and again they're not going to stay with our adventuring group through the entire adventure. I think I've given you enough of an instructional tutorial for you to learn how to play Warhammer Quest Silver Tower. If you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I'll be sure to answer them as quick as I can. You can also feel free to email me at Off the Shelf Board Game Reviews. That's OTSBGR at gmail.com. If you enjoy this video series, you want to help support the channel, toss a dollar over in the tip jar over at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash OTSBGR. If you enjoy this video and you enjoy this video series, Click that like button, click that subscribe button, and also help us get 5,000 subscribers so I can film my top 50 board games of all time video series. As always, thanks for watching.